Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the GIMS team is absolutely delighted to welcome you all to our third online event. Now, just over a week ago, GIMS celebrated its second birthday following its launch in London on the 5th of October 2018. Since then, the team has been working really hard to raise awareness through live events, social media, and its weekly blog news roundup to bring modern monetary reality into the public domain. It's been both a lot of hard work, but also an honor to be part of this growing movement across the world, which is starting to bear fruit. COVID-19 has without a doubt presented us as with many, for many organizations with new challenges in terms of its outreach. As such meetings become the norm, we hope to be able to continue our work with just as much enthusiasm and dedication in hope of better times to come. If you've been to one of our events before, it's really good to see you back. But for those perhaps for whom it is the first time, a very warm welcome and we hope that this event will inspire you to follow our work and learn more. Our objective is to provide an educational platform to challenge the economic orthodoxy that has defined our age. Our world has changed irrevocably in the last few months, and COVID-19 has revealed a public infrastructure unable to cope with the pressures placed upon it due to spending cuts, and other agenda-driven policies imposed by successive governments. As poverty and inequality rises and the tidal wave of climate change bears down upon us, solutions must be found. Creating a more equitable and fair and environmentally sustainable world should be at the top of our agenda. Achieving those aims demands a public conversation about our political and societal priorities and a realistic examination of the possibilities and constraints that exist to deliver them. Understanding how governments such as the UK's really spend will enable us to consider what our priorities should be and how they can be realized. Before I hand you over to our guests, just to remind you, GIMS has a website which is full of useful resources and links to external ones and where you can sign up to our newsletter for updates and make donations. We are a voluntary organisation and we depend on your contributions to continue our work. And again, I'd also like to give a quick plug to the MMT podcast with Christian Riley and Patricia Pino. Do tune in for their fantastic and informative library of podcasts featuring numerous interviews with MMT economists and other experts. So now, without further delay, I'm delighted to present our guests, our associate member, Phil Armstrong, who is joined in conversation with one of the founding proponents of modern monetary theory, all the way from the Virgin Islands, Warren Mosler. So a very good warm welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Prue. I'm just waiting for Warren to appear on the uh, on the screen. There he is. Uh, okay. Before I uh, start my first question, I'll, I'm just going to apologise for the last time I was interviewing when I was in the dark uh, and had a lot of extraneous noise. Uh, apparently today the dog's been taken out for a walk. I've moved the lighting through 90 degrees so you can see me a bit better. Not there's that much to see, but I'm looking a bit better. <laughs> Not as good as Warren, of course, out there in um, the Virgin I US Virgin Islands. Uh, just probably dragged him off the tennis court for uh, a few questions. Uh, just a little background before I ask Warren his first question. I first saw Warren uh, on a video introducing Paul Davidson uh, at a conference and I thought this guy seems uh, really amusing and would be interesting to talk to. So uh, I managed to get in touch with Warren uh, and he's incredibly patient. He managed to teach me MMT over a period of about two years. So everything I know, I'll learn from <laughs> Warren direct. Um, any mistakes, of course, remain uh, always my own. 
But the first question, Warren, it's for my conversations with you over the years, both you know in person and uh, in various media, you see things differently to most people. And, and that's not just in economics, it's also with your engineering, with your boat design, et cetera. So this is, a, you just see things that others miss. That's my view. I'm just interested, I'm sure the listeners, viewers are, when did you first see the, if you like, the, the, the MMT lens or the Moser economics lens on the world that others were making a mistake? When did it come to you, if you like? Oh, you know, if you'd asked me that question in advance, I might have had a really nice, coherent <laughs> three-minute answer. <laughs> so now I'm going to try to remember all this. Yeah, it's a while ago. But, you know, but so, but I know you wanted to trip me up. So here we go. Yeah. So I, it came to me as it um, became uh, relevant. So I can remember being at uh, Savings Bank of Manchester and. and somebody asking me about interest rates on loans and looking at different ways rates were calculated and present values and particularly car dealers who were always trying to uh, show rates maybe in a way that would, doesn't accurately reflect the, uh, the rates people were paying and regulations preventing that. So I, I started looking at, that was my first job, uh, collecting delinquent loans at a savings bank in 1973. And they also had me go to all the car dealers to uh, try and get them to use our bank to do business with that bank. There's a very small savings bank. It had maybe five or $10 million of capital, so tiny bank. So anyway, um, so as things were thrown at me, I look at them to see, I look at things like, well, how does that work? What makes it work? Just as a kid, I would take apart a clock to see how it worked or, well, try and figure out how a light bulb worked or anything else. So it's just a natural curiosity to see how things work, what's going on underneath to make things function. And it started the very first time I got involved in the very first job I had, which was at a small savings bank. And, and you know, when you, you talk a lot about the, the, uh, the, I don't, the Italian bond epiphany, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. Uh, how did that sort of crystallize your thinking of it? What, what was this background right. of that story? So uh, I had generated a pretty good understanding of monetary operations before that, because uh, I had worked at uh, Bankers Trust, or the primary, they were a primary dealer. I was on the, the money desk there in derivatives, Ginny Mae Securities, sales and uh, trading. Uh, options and futures and that type of thing. So I had a pretty good awareness of that going way back, but I had never had the uh, motivation or the, uh, it, was, it was never presented to me um, this, this last piece of the pie that became modern monetary theory. And that, that happened due to circumstances. Uh, Italian bonds were trading at approximately 12% in Lira and we could go borrow money. We could go borrow lira to pay for them at 10% with the same maturity. So there'd be no risk. We'd make a guaranteed profit of 2% in lira. And then whatever the profit was, we could sell it for dollars. But the risk was that uh, Italy might default. Uh, and back then, there were a lot of prominent economists. One of them was uh, Rudiger Dornbush, Rudy Dornbush. I think he was MIT. Was going around the world um, explaining why Italy would default in these lengthy reports, and I was thinking, well, you know, if we could come up with any reason why Italy might not default, then this would be a good position to have on for our investors. It'd be a good, uh, good investment. And uh, so I started thinking about why they might may or may not default. And I, I never had any reason to think of why a country may or may not default before. Nobody had asked a question and it didn't matter, but now it mattered. And so I started thinking about it. And the first answer I got when I talked to people, they say, well, you know, I said, why hasn't any country defaulted with a, with a floating exchange rate? And uh, they said, well, it's because they can always print the money. I said, okay. But when I look back, uh, no one had ever defaulted and, and no one had ever just printed the money. So yes, they could do that, but that couldn't be the reason they don't default because somebody would have done it by now. So, there, so uh, there, there, there's a better reason than that. And I was talking to a, 
a lot of different people. And at one point, I remember talking to my uh, research guy, Tom Schilke, and he uh, and it dawned on me. I said, Tom, you know, if we buy treasury securities, which we did, we were clients, if we buy treasury securities from the treasury, or if we buy them from the Fed, Federal Reserve, it doesn't make any difference to us. All the uh, money goes to the same place. We wire transfer the money to the same place. And we own the same thing, which was a basically a time deposit at the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay. And so if it, if it doesn't matter for us, anybody in the private sector, whether they buy securities from the Fed or the Treasury, then it, it can't matter to the economy because we are the economy. The only difference possible would be how they account for it on their side of the ledger, which is government accounting, which is just after the fact record keeping. So functionally, they have to be identical. Well, you know, at that point in time, treasury securities were there because presumably the treasury was funding expenditures. And Fed uh, was selling treasury securities when they did to support interest rates to keep a reserve excess from causing the rate to fall. So I said, okay, well, can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. And obviously, it's to support interest rates. It has nothing to do with funding expenditures. So that, that was the reason... Um, there's no risk in these securities because, uh, you know, continuing the logic from that point, you know, we all knew that the Fed can't do a reserve drain without doing a reserve ad first, which means they can't, payments can't be made to the government unless the government pays you first because all the funds to pay the taxes, all the funds to buy government bonds come from the government. The Fed credits your account either doing repos or some matter through payments. And they have to credit your account before they can debit your account. Because if they don't, if they debit it first, then you have an overdraft. And an overdraft is a loan from the Fed, which means they lent you the money first before they subtracted it. So either way, you know, they have to do a reserve ad in one form or another before they do a reserve trade. And so that, you know, so the, it, the whole reason you don't have a default issue is because the, the market in this, at that point in time had the sequence backwards. And the market would include every... Congressman at the time. These were back in the Ross Perot days, you know, when budget deficit was a big deal. And everybody in Congress thought that you had to get money through taxes to be able to spend. And what you did get, you had to then borrow from, it wasn't China back then, I think it was Japan or something. And, uh, you know, and, and leave the debt to the next generation, right? So, and so we're just looking here, okay, well, they've got that sequence backwards, and that's why they're afraid of default. Where is the money going to come from? Because once you understand that the government spends first, which then supplies the economy, so to speak, with the funds to pay the tax or with the funds to buy the bonds, the whole idea of solvency is, you know, it's obviated. There is, it doesn't make any sense. So, um, so that's why there's no default risk with these Italian bonds. Italy had their own currency. The lira was floating exchange rate. Italy is spending lira first when you got deep down into Federal Reserve operations. They were crediting accounts first and then debiting them when the debt was sold to transfer the lira to a separate account at the Bank of Italy. And so the whole idea of default just is not applicable to the situation. Well, uh, one of our clients was uh, Harvard Management at the time and they were running a endowment fund, and they wanted to buy these Italian bonds also. And I spoke with them, and that was uh, uh, Dave Middleman, Marie Samuels, long-time clients. And they um, said, okay, good, we got it. But before we do this, you know, let's go over and talk to those people to make sure. So I said, okay, well, they had the business card, said Harvard Management, they could set up the meetings. And they set up meetings at Treasury and a few other places in, in the Italian government. And I went over with Maurice, and... Uh, we had, we had meetings with various people, and the key meeting was with uh, Professor Luigi Spaventa, who was at Treasury at the time. I think he was Treasury Secretary or Assistant Secretary. And we go in, and he's all dressed up in his three-piece suit, looking very much like Keynes with the pipe and all that, and, uh, uh, expecting complaint because that's all they ever got there. Uh, because people were complaining about not getting paid by Italy. People were waiting for withholding tax. And the reason they weren't getting paid is the people making withholding tax, there were only two of them. And one of them was pregnant, so she wasn't in the office and the other one couldn't keep up with the work. And all these international people are coming in saying, where's our money? But it wasn't a solvency problem, they just had an administrative problem. 
And uh, so I said, I said to him, I said, Professor Spaventa, now don't answer this, it's just a rhetorical question, but, you know, why is Italy selling all these BTP, CCTs, Italian bonds? Is it to get the lira to spend? Or is it because you spend first, and then if you don't sell, uh, which adds reserves, we are reserves to the system. If you don't sell the CCTs or BTPs to do a reserve drain, then the uh, overnight rate will fall to zero uh, because it'll be an excess reserve position and your policy rate is 12% or whatever it was, 10, 12%. And so to support this policy rate, you have to sell securities. And he, you know, he looks at me and he thinks for a couple, uh, a minute or so, half a minute, and he says, no, the rate would not fall to zero. It would only fall to a half a percent because we pay a half a percent support rate on balances. I said, perfect. I've got a guy who understands monetary operations. I've been to a lot of central banks. Nobody at that level uh, understood monetary operations. Well, I didn't have to say anything else. Within another 10 seconds, he jumps out of his seat. He goes into this rage about the IMF and how they were making them act pro-cyclical, you know, and they had to have austerity and all that. Otherwise, they were going to default. And on, the, on his desk was this paper, I don't know, an inch thick from Rudy Dornbush about why Italy was going to default. And, uh, and we didn't have to say anything more. You know, it, it was... It was all doom and gloom over there. They were ready to default, I guess. And all of a sudden, it's a party. And he starts, we're supposed to be there 20 minutes. He starts inviting in people from the other, mis other ministers from the other rooms. And they, they have a big, huge cappuccino machine. And they start making us cappuccino. And everybody's like celebrating. And two hours later, Maurice and I had to get out of there and go to our next meeting. But anyway, a week later, uh, the announcement came out from the finance ministry. No extraordinary measures will be taken. All payments will be met on time because they realized they're just credit accounts and there's no, absolutely nothing to be gained and a lot to be lost by not just doing that. And the crisis went away because it was never actually there, you know, much like our budget crisis today. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great, a great story, yeah. Warren. I yeah, mean, yeah. I really enjoy it. And you know, <laughs> I, I can picture the scenes oh, yeah. Yeah. in the room. You know, I, I, yeah, I love that story. I hope that people listening kind of can connect real events to, to your thinking and the way yeah. you told it. Uh, so so I, was, I was walking into the, uh, the room at Treasury, the building. Yeah. They have these huge arches for, um, to walk through. They must be 20 feet tall. Yeah. And as we're getting towards it, I go to Maurice and I go, Duck your head, and he ducks down. <laughs> and then he looks up. <laughs> he just starts laughing, and uh, <laughs> he said that so people could come in with their horses with their spears. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose that under the gold standard, yeah, maybe maybe there was some relevance to it. A bit like when people yeah. were on horses with spears, there might have been you know some relevance. Yeah. To the arches. I might be yeah. uh, trying to make too clever an analogy. Now, Warren, here's the thing. I don't let, me just, let me just say quickly. Now, a few, year, a few years ago, I was talking to somebody at the Bank of Italy, yeah. and I came up with a way they could save money. I just, why don't you send all the guards home? You don't have any money here anymore. <laughs> what are they going to do? Come in and steal your Target 2 deficit? You know, there's no gold. There's no money. <laughs> I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know the union of guards would have liked it, if there is such a thing. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Warren. Yeah. Don't you and I've got a few questions for you. So don't answer yeah. them all at once. So you've got to try okay. to summarize this. So okay. the guy said to you, well, what would be the main differences in conceptualization of, uh, of the economy from an MMT or from a mainstreamer? Now you can you, you can make an MMT -er, uh, and, a, and a mainstream, you can categorize them in any way you like, and just like yeah. the basics. And then what I'll do is I'll try and develop what you say in, in the rest of the question. So like a okay. summary, you know, okay. you do it. So, um, you know, if, if an economist says, yeah, we need deficit spending now, but and it, because interest rates are low, the market is telling us it's a good time for the government to borrow. Wrong. <laughs> or right for the wrong reason, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you, you get that kind of thing around the edges. Or, yes, the debt to GDP ratio is 85%, but, you know, Japan's up to 200, and they're not having a problem. So it's probably okay to, you know, to, to add 
spent more public services or cut taxes or something like that. So those types of things show that this person does not understand monetary operations. Mm -hmm. They're out of paradigm. They're thinking of whether they know it or not, a fixed exchange rate world like the gold standard that you talked about. And so whenever you hear that gold standard fixed exchange rate rhetoric come into a conversation where there's a floating exchange rate policy, you know, this person is, is out of paradigm. And um, so, uh, this is not a question for me. It came in from uh, yeah. one of the other members of the team. It could, yeah. it could have even been Neil, who uh, has been sending me a few questions. But oh, yeah. sometimes, I, I mean, not to be rude, I like to laugh at mainstreamers. It's a hobby of mine, and maybe yeah. I ought do it but sometimes mainstreamers say to me well you don't understand mainstream economics well i reckon i do i thought it for 30 years so yeah well, what be your sort of response to some you know when you criticize mainstreamers when they say well you just don't understand what we're doing what what would be your response that that's the question what would you say well, you know them? usually i don't my criticisms are yes you're correct but that applies to a fixed exchange rate you know, policy and not today's floating exchange rate. So they're normally correct in some context like that because their models all have assumptions in them. And, yeah. and so they don't work, they don't do the maths wrong usually. Okay, so based on the assumptions in their model, the model's probably correct. So I don't take the approach that the model is wrong, that their forecasts are wrong. It's just that they might not apply to a world that's operating under a different set of assumptions than what they're using. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of think um, mainstream economics is a bit like studying the, the biology of a unicorn. I mean, given the assumptions of what a unicorn is, it's really good. The yeah. only problem is that the unicorn doesn't actually exist. Well, as far as I know. So, yeah. And then when you try and apply it to the world of horses, yeah. there's a little bit of trouble. Yeah, um, yeah. One thing I'm going to move on now, uh, Warren, is you've got a great way of analysing monetary policy where uh, the central bankers have it all backwards. And I absolutely love your analysis of that. Obviously, we we wrote a paper together with all your original thinking and my name on it too, so many thanks for that, which is now gracing the webs, uh, website at GIMS. If you haven't read the paper we, with Warren and I on monetary policy, it's fantastic, honestly. Read it. So, Warren, I just wonder if you could explain what, what central bankers think about the relationship between interest rate changes and expansionary contractionary policy changes and, and what it actually is, because it also amuses me. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I've talked to a fair amount of them, and um, one in particular who is very good at, is the best at monetary operations, is Charles Goodhart. Yeah. And, and, you know, we speak the same language. There's no issue there. And I talk about how the government's a net payer of interest. And so, um, therefore, when rates go up, it's a fiscal transfer into the economy, which I would think would support the economy. And he doesn't disagree with that. And on the other hand, you've got the um, uh, differences in propensities to consume as you suspend interest income. So in other words, in the economy itself, there's a rate where um, for every loan in a bank, there's a deposit for every borrower, there's a lender. Does a cut in interest rates cause the borrowers to spend more than the savers cut back? It causes the saver to cut back because he's lost some interest. The borrower saves some money, so he's gained some money. Does it, is the borrower more of a factor than the saver? And they call that the differences in the propensities to spend up interest income. And he'll think those, he'll say, look, I think those factors are strong in, a, in current markets that, uh, uh, you know, that effect you're talking about through the interest income channel might not be enough to do what you think it does. And I'll agree. I'll say, look, I, I suspect it does with debt to GDP ratios at 100%. We're talking about, you know, Differences that net interest income added, even though it goes to interest income in general, generally, generally has a fairly low as you consume, um, or relatively low, then uh, it's, it seems to me it's got to be overwhelming. And as debt to GDP gets higher, it's got to be larger and larger. And so, he, well, you know, we don't really have a disagreement in 
principle about how it all works. He just thinks that the uh, lowering rates is still overall an expansionary bias and raising rates is contractionary, deflationary, where I, I think it's the opposite. And I don't have the tools to do all the econometrics, but, and that was, we first started talking about this probably 1995. So I said 25 years ago. And back then there was all this talk about Japan and zero rates, certainly in the late nineties. Was going to be an inflationary thing, and they just started doing quantitative easing, massive amounts more than we can imagine, and currency depreciation, inflation. It's like, well, we'll see. So now, thirty years on, Japan still <laughs> is trying to <laughs> create inflation. They failed to create inflation. Central bank tried everything it has. Okay, it tried and uh, been trying as hard as it can and failed. The European Central Bank has tried as hard as it can failed to create inflation with negative rates and whatnot. And the Fed tried as hard as it can and was failing. Uh, it then raised rates a little bit. Inflation went up a little bit. I'm not sure. Could be the cause, right? It's based on my bias. And now when they brought rates back down again, it, you know, inflation's come back down again. Now I know there's COVID and there's other things going on, but through all these backgrounds, you go across a lot of different countries in the world, and when they cut their rates, the inflation is coming. Now, look at how low the inflation rate is in Brazil. Look at how low their interest rate is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can't prove causation. I can't say they brought the rate down because inflation was coming down anyway. They can't say the rate lower rate didn't, didn't bring inflation down, you know, any more than I can. So, uh, but now I've got thirty years of data, let's say 25 years of data, pretty hard data, that certainly doesn't contradict what I'm saying. I, I think it entirely reinforces it. And, and then I came up, I started thinking about another channel, which I've also thought about for a while, which is the forward pricing channels, which uh, fits the academic definition of inflation. And uh, where the policy rate is the rate of inflation as an academic would define it, not necessarily as a central banker or congressman, but as an academic would define it. And it, it all keeps pointing to the same answer, that when you raise rates, you're causing inflation through different channels, and you're causing the uh, economy to expand, aggregate demand to go up and not down. Through a peculiar channel, you're paying interest to people who already have money. You hear this basic income argument out there, should we have it, should we not have it? Well, a positive rate of interest is basic income for people who already have money. If you have money, you get more money for free. There's no supply side. It's just all on the demand side. And uh, with all the talk I've heard about UBI, uh, basic income, I've never heard anybody recommend that we give it only to people who have money in the bank. <laughs> so uh, I don't think anybody would support that as a way to spur growth. I certainly don't. I, it's, it's like I'm my, probably near my last choice of how to get the economy to grow. I'd ra much rather have you know an increase in public services or a investment or a decrease in taxes that decide to just increase government deficit spending by giving it to people who already have money. I mean, that's just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Okay. So other central bankers, uh, the people in monetary operations like Vince Reinhardt, who I knew pretty well, spoke at some of our conferences, helped me write some of my speeches. I mean, this guy really understands monetary operations and uh, more certainly even more detail than I do. He was Greenspan's right-hand man for 15, 10 years. He was head of monetary affairs. He was with Bernanke, Greenspan and then Bernanke. And he understands it exactly. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't talk about it, but he certainly understands it. And the other people I talked to at the Fed and the Treasury, they all seem to understand it. Uh, a friend of mine was visiting Treasury a few years ago, talking to somebody, pretty frankly, and he asked them, one of the officers, and he asked him if he'd read my book. <laughs> and the answer was, well, yes, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so now I'm somewhere in the, I'm, I'm up there with Marx now, right? Or people in government, if they've read your book, don't want you to tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess if you were the, um, say you were the court astrologer to the Duke of Parma or somebody, you know, yeah. when this, uh, you know, when Galileo was out there and yeah. uh, you 
you're thinking, well, I quite like the sound of this Galileo chap. He's right, but I ain't going to say anything because I've got a nice cushy job uh, being the astrologer of uh, the Duke of Palmer, and I'm getting making yeah. a lot for it. So uh, I think it's an old cliche. It's hard to do something when your salary says... Yeah, but you know what? I don't, I don't see that with these Fed people. They're very right. nice. They're, they're sincere. It's just not what they do. Right. You know, okay. they're, they're like quiet academics that were brought in. They're not flashy or anything. They mm -hmm. work hard. Yeah. When I asked uh, the guys who do the uh, compute, the, uh, they do the econometrics to try and detect the uh, differences in propensity to consume out of interest income. They say, look, we think that it's stronger on the borrower side than the saver, but because I can't detect it in the econometrics. He's been there for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So if those, if those propensities are that close, the interest has to overwhelm that. Okay. Cause that's not close. I mean, it's, just a question whether the other one's larger. I think we'll so see. They, I, they, Sorry, they do have it backward. Yeah. So anyway, just to, to conclude the first question, which was, yes, they do have the interest rate thing backwards. Yeah. Okay. Raising rates is inflationary. It is expansionary. To me, all the data shows it. And, mm -hmm. and the reverse is true. Lowering rates like they've done is contractionary and deflationary. And, and so they're trying to create inflation. They lower rates. But the, the inflation doesn't go back, it gets worse. And so then they lower rates again and the inflation's even lower. And I've used the analogy of a carpenter with a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. No matter how much I cut off, it's still too short. You're still doing that today, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 What I think is interesting and will be interesting maybe for the people listening in is obviously yeah. you've created this idea of the like the guys on the shop floor, the professionals, they know what they're doing. They're not flashy guys. But I think right, they, right. you can use the phrase, the appointees at the top, they don't get it. So in right. a sense, you just think, so we're not saying there's a conspiracy theory. And so, so where yeah. does the break come between the guys who are doing it, who yeah. really kind of get it, and the guys, the appointees, if you like, the ones that don't? What's your experience with this? Well, you, like well, you know, I used to ask Vince that, and he'd say, I'd say, Vince, how many people at the Federal Open Market Committee, I think it's 30, understand monetary operations, you know, like how the checks clear? He goes, zero. Because that's our biggest problem here, trying to explain it to these people. They all bring in this other, their own ideas about how things work, and none of them actually know. That included Chairman Bernanke at the time. He did not know <laughs> monetary operations. He didn't know how it worked. And, uh, and he's certainly a nice guy, and I give him well-meaning, you know, good American, whatever, yeah. no conspiracy or anything. He's not, uh, he's got, you know, his heart's in the right place. But same thing with Janet Yellen. He met with Janet Yellen. And, and they just don't understand the basic monetary operations. Yeah. You know, you, you know why she was replaced, by the way? No, I don't know that. It was, it was right there, public information. President Trump didn't think she was tall enough. It looked like <laughs> a Fed chairman. So he wanted somebody taller. Ironically, she was the biggest dove on interest rates. And so the taller person he did replace her with, you know, was more hawkish on interest rates and they got in a big fight. So if he if wanted low rates, he would have left her there. But he wasn't tall enough. <laughs> this is just like, you, you yeah. can't script it. It's crazy. Well, he said he goes to central casting for his appointees. He, he, you know, he wants them to look the part. That's Did how he does it. Didn't you tell, isn't there a story it was about Larry Summers? I think it was Larry Summers who, who you had a word with, or someone who said he didn't understand reserve accounting. Of some yeah. You know, that was in my book, and it's more yeah. accurate probably in the book, because I haven't read the book in 10 years. But um, yeah. Yeah, Well, you so, can read your own books, would you? I mean, leave that to others. But yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but sorry, Mike, if I get it wrong correctly, but I said something like, like, Larry, what's wrong with the deficit? He says, well, it takes away, you know, uh, uh, Money it takes away savings that could be used for investment. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's and, and I go, so I go like, no, it doesn't. All it does is offset operating factors at the Fed. It doesn't have to do with savings or investment. He says, well, you know, I don't, I don't really understand reserve accounting, so I can't discuss it at that level. <laughs> and I had the senator, head of the Senate, Tom Dash, who was sitting next to me, he set up the meeting. He's just kind of rolling his eyes, looking at Summers, like, what do you mean you don't understand this? <laughs> Yeah, well, it is very, it is funny. I, I mean, these things are comical. And people yeah. often, the sense of all this, you know, all these guys know they're just sort of plotting against us behind closed doors. But the reality is nothing like that. I mean, as you say, it's, yeah. <laughs> they don't really get it. Or some yeah. people yeah. do, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily the people who we think would get it. Uh, 
Well, Warren, I might follow up. Now, one of the things that you talk about, I think it's, it's very, very interesting uh, and, and a very different. And just to whet the listener's appetite, I've managed to twist Warren's arm again to write another paper with this sort of uh, comprehensive school teacher from England. And we're, he's, and we're writing on inflation and the Weimar Republic, you know. Uh, it will be appearing out soon, I hope, on Gims if, if the girls want it. And if Warren's name's on it, I'm sure they will. Now, one of the things <laughs> is I, I'm keen on putting an MMT lens, if you want, on Weimar. Yeah. Initially, what, what I persuaded Warren to do, just to explain to everyone, is have a look at my long-winded waffle on inflation, edit it down, which he's been doing. And, and, but the way that you define inflation and discuss its causes... Going back to that very first point I made about how you see things differently, I think it's got, even compared to the many of the MMT community, I think, how you kind of pinpoint the origin, the nature of inflation, what it is, what causes yeah. it, it's quite different. I think the listeners will be very eager to hear what you think about this inflation question. Well, first of all, uh, I just emailed you that I got through the whole thing. Oh, I'm now. now that is so, great. So, so, so now you got a draft to start cleaning up, but it, at least it's, I think it's organized coherently. Yeah. But I did it on the screen, so I'm not sure that I've got the one, two, three in the sub the titles. I can do at least organized. do something, Warren. I, 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 yeah. can do, I, I have and, a job of proofreading mainstream papers. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pay, and I think it's, pay. there's so probably this, still some of, the, some of the points where you had long explanations for, I cut down because. They weren't um, that relevant to the, what the paper says now. They were relevant to what the paper said that you had produced, but I, we kind of changed the voice of the paper and they were, they were speaking to a different point. I'm not sure I cut enough, so we'll see. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll play with that. We, this is a yeah, we, we, want, that, Warren. we want to cut as much as possible. So what happened at, in 1992 or whenever the Italian thing happened, the idea that the funds to pay taxes by bonds comes from the government puts – what we, we, you know, what I realized at the time is it's just a simple monopoly, and it couldn't be simpler, you know, any more than a bus token for a bus company. It's just a simple, thing. and so that meant the price level. The monopolists are price center. Now you teach some, you taught some uh, micro, right? Yeah, yeah. So first thing you teach is monopoly, right? Okay, so how long does that take you? Me personally. I mean, not to teach it in a class. For, Probably a couple of weeks, but... Uh, just mono Monopoly itself? I don't know. I think it was like more like a half hour. Right? There's not well, much to say about it. If I just want to do it briefly, I can do it in five minutes. But I mean, you know... Yeah, yeah. Really okay, so let's let's say in an introductory course. Introductory micro. Yeah. Introductory micro, first-year students. Yeah, yeah. But you spent 10, half hour on Monopoly, maybe? Yeah, okay. At the Could most. Okay. Yeah. Then you go on to Oligopoly, right? How long does that take? A little longer. Yeah, maybe two hours or something. Yeah. Okay, then you go on to then 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 you get into competition. Mm -hmm. You know, multiple more than I'll go, and yeah. that takes the rest of your life, right? <laughs> Seemingly, yes. Yeah, and, th and then you have to learn what an asymptote is and all that fancy math, right? Yeah, it did. okay, but but not with monopoly. Monopoly is a ten minute one, right? Mm -hmm. You get you kind of get it. You got it. They want it. You set the price. Mm -hmm. That's it. If you don't. If you let them set the price, you still have to agree to it. You're still price set. There's no way around it because there's no competition. Okay. The good news is the money is the easy one. <laughs> the currency is the easy one. It's the monopoly. And the government's got what the economy needs. There's a government, uh, you know, our money story begins with a tax liability where the government levies a tax. I don't know what, why. What's the government trying to do? It's trying to provision itself and need soldiers and public health workers and you know, economics teachers. And so it, um, how does it do it? Well, it, it, it imposes a tax liability. That's what underpins the whole system. Tax liabilities come first. And not tax collection. Remember, everybody else thought it was tax collection, but it's not, it's tax liability. Tax collection comes last. Okay, so first it's a tax liability. That creates people who suddenly need those funds to be able to pay the tax. So they are now what we call unemployed. So the tax liability creates unemployment. And in fact, it's the only source of unemployment. If you 
drill down enough here. So the tax liability, the government creates unemployment by imposing a tax liability. Why? So now we can hire those people to become economics professors and soldiers and legal assistants, uh, you know, legal system. Uh, by spending, it's what I say is otherwise worthless currency. So now it can do that, which it then does. So first the tax liability, then people show up, all right, what do I have to do to get the money? Government says, be a soldier, I'll give you $50,000 a year. They say, fine. They come in, they get the $50,000, they take their money, and they pay their tax, their tax, which is going to be less than that. But then tax, the economy pays taxes back to the government. And so taxes get paid as the last thing. Okay, so, and that's why it's called a tax return, because you're returning the revenues. Revenue is the word return in French or Latin, or one of those languages I didn't study. Okay, and so it's uh, some money, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, yeah. returning to the government what came from the government. Yeah. Okay, so it's a monopoly. And so the, the value of that thing is whatever the government tells you you have to do to get it. Okay, so um, I gave the, do I have time to review this Pompeii anecdote? Yeah, My you wife do. And I, we're, yeah, we're visiting, because it, it, I just saw another article on that somewhere, which confirmed the whole thing. So they were, we were in Pompeii on one of those, we dropped in and jumped on one of those tours mm -hmm. and uh, they showed us the coins and he held up his little coins. He said, these were found in the ashes. What, what would have been somebody's pocket or what would have been a cash register or would have been under a mattress. Mm -hmm just in the street. And uh, Pompeii was a very nice place to live because we had good public services uh, because yes, taxes were high. They would collect these coins for taxes and then they would pay people to, for sanitation and for public safety and construction and all that. So you know me, I'm a bit of a troublemaker. So I, I said to the guide, I said, uh, well, you know, actually they would pay the people first and then they would collect the coins. He goes, no, 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 you collect taxes, you get the coins, and then you pay the people. So I said, well, where'd the coins come from? He says, well, the government made them. <laughs> and they were not, they were like copper coins. They weren't like expensive coins. And by the way, they were only found within 50 miles of Pompeii. They were not found anywhere else. So the, he says, the government made them. I said, well, then how did anybody get a coin to pay the tax? He says, so they spent them first and then they pay the tax. I said, like, yeah, how else could it work? He grabs his head like this. He goes, no, 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 no. And he went away. And he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the tour. Okay. He spoiled it for him. Yeah. He's been a guide for 20 years. So, <laughs> look, I guarantee you 2,000 years ago, everybody in Pompeii knew that they put a tax liability on your house or something, resident tax or something. The population owed tax. Some people showed up for work. They get paid, they buy things from other people, everybody could pay their tax, and the coins would get returned to Pompeii that they spent first and then collected the tax. Now, the archaeologists have found, like last I saw, 20,000 coins in the street. So, how did they get there? Well, the government must have spent more than they collected. <laughs> That's the budget deficit, right? Yeah. They spent 100,000 and they only collected 80,000 for tax. People earned extra coins so they could have a money supply for savings, for to have to be able to make change at the stores. You know, parents would uh, take them home as souvenirs or something when they came to visit. But they spent more than they collected. And what are those coins in the street? Those are the public debt. Okay, so when you look at the sequence correctly, public debt are the coins that were paid out and spent. Some were used to pay as taxes. Some stayed in the street. Public debt are the coins that were spent but not yet used to pay tax. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, today, if they ever restarted, you could pay your tax with those coins, but it all uh, expired, you know, a couple thousand years ago. But that's what they are. Okay, so the public debt today is nothing more than the pounds spent by the government that haven't yet been used to pay taxes, and they're sitting there in the street. Today, the street is bank accounts. So they're in reserve accounts at the Bank of England. They're in securities accounts called. Uh, guilds or whatever they call them, debt over there. And um, that's the public debt. So how do you pay it back? If you ask somebody in Pompeii, oh, oh am I still on here? So, so if, you, if you ask somebody in Pompeii, oh, all those coins in the street, that's the public debt. How do you pay it back? They go like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. The question's not applicable. 
right? Yeah. Am I still on my screen? Just flash for the name. No, no, you, you're okay. Oh, okay, it's, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, good. Okay, so the the idea of paying it back is not even applicable. It's not an applicable question. What do you mean? Yeah. And so, uh, so today you've got pounds that were spent by the government. They get credited to account A at the Bank of England called the reserve account. Mm -hmm. Then they offer account B, which are securities accounts, time deposits. And so uh, people decide they want to move their money from a uh, account A to account B, from a checking account to a savings account. That's all it really is. Uh, same as any commercial bank. And that's called going into debt. Account B, the time deposit is the debt. Account A is not. Okay. It's a, you know, it's definition. It's arbitrary. Call whatever you want. It's not wrong. It's just a definition. And so how, what happens when the bonds mature and they have to be paid back? The central bank, the Bank of England, debits the securities account and credits the reserve account. They shift the balance. They're both just pound balances in account A and pound balances in account B. Well, when they mature, they subtract the pound balance. They make the pound balance in account B smaller and make the balance in account A larger. There are no grandchildren and no taxpayers in the room. <laughs> It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not paying it back. It's transferring it back. Yeah. Selling the securities transfers funds from account A to account B. Maturities paying it back transfers it from account B back to account A. All on the books of the Bank of England. It's not any kind of a financial event of any consequence of anybody who care about. And so you know this thing you say, Warren. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about how. If the price level goes up, it's necessary. Oh, yeah. So we're talking about the price level. Yeah. Yeah. The function of, uh, you know, governments paying higher prices. You know, yeah. I think it's very interesting. You know, so in other words, the government. So, yeah. So let's go back to Pompeii. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the coin worth? Yeah. Okay. So let's say you, you become a, uh, a, you know, a police officer and they pay you, um, you know, uh, one coin a day. Mm hmm. And maybe your tax is uh, five coins a month or something. So you have extra money to spend on your life. And you're going to be working full time. You didn't have to, but you, you want to work full time because you don't want to make pizza and you don't want to raise cattle or do whatever your other person does. They don't want to be police officers. They'd rather you go out and make your 30 coins and then you can go out and buy the stuff from them. And then everybody will have their five coins to pay the tax. Okay. So you go out and work. So what? What's a coin worth? Well, let's say you got somebody raising chickens or, and you want to uh, or make it pizza and you want to buy pizza. Well, what's, how does the market decide what a coin's worth? Well, it's worth a day's work. You know, the coin is worth a day's work. And so you get these, uh, what do you call it? A dual something of wants or something? You're, you're the economic. Yeah, double coincidence of wants. Double coincidence of wants. That's it. I couldn't yeah, think yeah, of it. Yeah. So, so you get this double coincidence of wants. And um, it turns out that uh, this guy can make so many pizzas a day and, you know, he'll, he'll do, uh, you know, one coin for him. He doesn't have to work a day. He's willing to give you 10 pizzas for the coin. And that's the market price. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that price is based on what you have to do to get the money from the government. So he gets paid a coin and he could buy 10 pizzas. But let's say the government said, you know what? I'm going to pay you two coins a day instead of one coin. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the price of a pizza? I mean, how many pizzas do you get for one coin? You only get five pizzas, right? Mm, yeah. Because you can earn a pizza in a half a day. Mm -hmm. Guy's not going to give you 10. For, if he had to give you 10 pizzas for a coin, he'd go work and be a police officer. Your double coincidence of wants gives you a relative value in terms of day's work is 10 pizzas. So now they're paying two coins, so I have Okay, so... The coin is worth what the government says you have to do to get it. Okay, if they say you have to work a week, five days to earn one coin, now a coin's worth 50 pizzas. Right? So the government paying more for the same thing, all it does is redefine the value of the coin lower. Oh, we're going to give everybody a raise. Let's pay them two coins. Well, all of a sudden, the coin's worth half as much, and you only buy you know, five pizzas with a coin. That's inflation. That's a change. Well, that's not even inflation. Inflation is a continuous change in the price level. That's a one-time change in the price level. To have inflation, the government has to do that continuously. Right. We'll, we'll pay you one coin a day. 
We'll pay you two coins a day. We'll pay you five coins a day. We'll pay you one coin an hour for eight hours. We'll pay you two coins an hour. The continuous increase in the price level comes only from a continuous exchange with government where the government's paying more for the same thing. There's no, as a point of logic, there's no other source of the price level. And MMT is the only school of thought, at the, you know, in today's world that understands that. I mean, 150 years ago, yeah. maybe everybody understood it. I'm not, in Pompeii, everybody knew it. It was perfectly obvious. Yeah. But it's been lost. Yeah. And, and right now, that's our country, one of our main contributions to the understanding of economics that the other economic schools of thought absolutely don't understand. They've got inflation expectations and all this other nonsense in there, money supply. And they've totally missed the idea that it's a monopoly. It's economics 101, the easiest kind. It takes 15 minutes to teach it. Price monopolist is price setter. Now, thing is, even the other MMT proponents don't emphasize this. And it's yeah. one of our lead contributions to the world. And they'll talk about, well, you won't create inflation until you run out of capacity. And then if you try to spend more than what you have, for, it's not what we're saying. I mean, that's not wrong. Mm. What we're saying is the government goes to buy things. If it's paying the same price, you're not creating inflation. If suddenly they're offered to you at a higher price and you buy it as a government, now you're redefining your currency downward the same way that Pompeii paid more for the wage. And you are changing the price level. Okay, because in a market economy, in theory, you only have to change one price and then everything else is relative value. Not that that holds up 100%. There's all kinds of institutional structure in there that has you know, frictions and whatnot. But that's conceptually, that's what's going on. Yeah. And so it's not when you run out of capacity, it's when you have to, when the market presents you with higher prices. If you decide to pay those higher prices, then you have redefined your currency down. It used to be called crying down the value of the coin. Under yeah. Alfred the Great and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, oh, um, yeah. So, okay. So we know that. Mm. But you're not getting, I don't know. Do you hear that a lot out of MMT proponents? Not much. Um, right? A little bit around the edges. Not much. I mean, I, I, they don't think lead with it. They don't lead with it, right? I think it's probably a bit quote unquote out there. I think one of the things is that they have a lot of MMT is a such a lot of time getting, getting over this, you know, tax liability comes first and tax collection comes yeah. last, that when they hit people with the, the inflation is because the government's paying a higher price yeah. than previously, yeah. I think that they think, whoa, I'm not going to risk that yet. Uh, right. I, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. as a point of logic, to me, it is absolutely certain. So, so what maybe happened is... Is... Maybe back off it a bit because I think it's yeah. quite tricky to get across. So what happened in Weimar to cause prices to go up? The government paid higher prices. Yeah. Okay. And, and They're all, there was... now the papers out there, yeah. uh, they can all enjoy it. Now, Warren, yeah. I've, I've got to press on a bit because there's a lot of other questions yeah. I've got on my yeah. list. I mean, I could talk to you about inflation for another half hour. Yeah. Uh, but then people won't bother reading our papers because we've given them the answers. So we've whetted their yeah. appetite, haven't we? They're all waiting for it to emerge. But the one yeah. thing is a question... Now, it was sent to me, I think, from a, a viewer. So I may, uh, I'm trying to paraphrase it. And apologies to the person who sent it, if I don't say it correctly. From what I gather, someone has said, like, Warren says that uh, unemployment is all, always uh, a monetary phenomenon. But what about, say, a guy who's prepared to work for, say, I don't know, chickens, you know, so if, if, if some guy's prepared to pay him in chickens. And so he could be unemployed if the guy who was paying him in chickens, refuses to do so. How would you kind of fit that into the overall idea that unemployment is always a monetary phenomenon? Unemployment as we define it. To the, to the person putting the question forward. That's how we define it. We define it as people looking for paid work. Right. If it's somebody looking to volunteer for the American Cancer Society, we don't consider that person unemployed. And uh, if somebody here wants to work for chicken that's fine and he's look, going around looking for a job that pays the chicken yeah. it's really not not applicable but uh, what we would do is impute the value of a chicken and say he's actually looking for the dollar ten dollars that a chicken cost uh, because he 
He wants to trade it rather than get the money because he's trying to avoid taxes. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so you have, yeah, you have to use it yeah. when you have taxation, you have to use imputed value. Otherwise it's too yeah. much. There's too much. There's tax evasion. Right. Well, thanks for that. And I hope the, the originator of the question uh, won't yeah. be too hard on me if I got the wording wrong. Now, now, Warren, here's another point. Is oh, that, wait a minute. Let me finish that answer. Sorry. No. Look, in a, bar, in a barter type of economy or in a non-monetary economy, you do not get unemployment. When you right. went to American Indians or to Africa before the Europeans came in, yeah. where they didn't have monetaries, they did not have unemployment. You went into a village, everybody was doing something. The grandmother was taking care of the kids. The wife was doing this. The husband was doing his stuff. And if they came up with a labor-saving device, they didn't have people out of work. They just had other things they did. Yeah. And, uh, it's not that they didn't have leisure. But they didn't yeah. have people who were considered unemployed looking for jobs that couldn't do it. Okay, it only happens in a monetary society, and that's the reason because yeah. a monetary society begins with coercive taxation, and that's the beginning of unemployment as we define it today. Yeah. We didn't have Marx's mass unemployment before there was a monetary system. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, okay. The point I, what, what I was going to come on to next, if, if, I always think that, you know, this idea that, you know, the government has to spend all then before it can tax or borrow. It's a very powerful idea. We, we draw people in. Yeah. Obviously, the inf your nuanced and logic position on inflation is yeah. difficult to explain. But nevertheless, I think the logic is inescapable. Now, the other big area, I know MMT is find hard to explain. And there are, in my opinion, people who are under the M. I'm not to be impolite kind of under the MMT umbrella when it suits them, shall we say. Yeah. Don't buy into MMT's idea that, you know, exports are a real cost and imports yeah. real gain. To me, this is another thing that MMT is who, who find it difficult to explain. So in a sense, imagine, you you know, you, you're, you're advising an MMT activist. How would you deal yeah. with that trade question? I'm sure you've come across it many times. You know the people I'm talking about who don't. Yeah. Try to a tangent with it, you know, off, off piste, shall we say? Yeah. Well, it's going to be even more difficult when they try and explain my understanding of quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 we won't bring that one this one. We'll have to write a on that. But you'll be on your own, I can't help. I'll write a So we're, the good news is we're still at the easy stuff. Yeah. All right. So, but yes, well, it's chapter five in the book. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. Most of them haven't read it, but no. What, so what it is, is um, there's a sequence to explaining it. Yeah. And the sequence I use is to first explain what is real wealth. So real wealth, I call your pile of stuff. Yeah. So your pile of stuff is everything you can build domestically. Everything, all, your, all your domestic output makes your pile of stuff larger. Yeah. Okay. And the more people you have working domestically, the larger that pile of stuff. Okay. Uh, imports makes the pile larger. Exports makes the pile smaller. So you want to optimize your real wealth. So you want your pile of stuff to be as high as possible. So that means you want to produce everything you can domestically. Sustaining full employment is a big thing because that's usually more of a factor than imports and exports. Okay. And that does give you your, like you say, chips to trade for. You know, that's where the exports come from. It's your, part of your domestic production. Okay. So it's everything there. And then, and then you try to add to that as many net imports as possible. In other words, for everything you export, that's your cost of your import. You've got to go from you to them and you import. And you try and, um, that's called optimizing your real terms of trade is making your pile as large as possible. And then I just throw in the idea. You can always... Uh, Sometimes, I say, but I like to use the extremes. So everybody thinks exports are so great, right? So what would happen if you exported everything and didn't import anything? Well, then everybody dies. You have no food, you have no clothes, you have no fuel. <laughs> You've exported everything. Yeah, yeah. You're all dead. Right? <laughs> so let, let's say you import everything and don't export anything. Well, now you're all doing pretty well. You got everything and you don't have to work. Yeah. So from, you know, in, in real terms, when you take a look at it that way, you can see that, you know, the exports are the cost and the imports are the benefit. Yeah. And the other 
little quip I use is that it's the opposite of religion. Yeah. Economics is the opposite of religion. It's better to receive than to give. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, uh, good to me. Yeah. So from there, what's, I say, okay, what's the problem? And then they come up with all these. The first thing they say is, well, what you don't understand because you're an American is uh, that you can't do that if you have a small open economy. <laughs> so for, for 30 years, you know, the first thing anybody says to me about anything I say is, well, what, what you don't understand is, it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not like I haven't been through this with a lot of people. Let me add this. Look, I've been going through this for a long time. Yeah. The one thing I've been hoping for this whole time is that somebody will just tell me I'm wrong where, where I can understand that. Then I can give it up and get a life doing something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm still trying to do that. So if you've got something, you know, I'm, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. You know, yeah. tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. You convince me. I'm not going to be the man to do that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the other thing to do on the related point, Warren, is yeah. you you know where I'm going with this. You talk about trade and everything. I was going to go. There's a sort of hush. And some guy will go, oh, but what about the exchange rate? It'll crash. It'll tank. You yeah. know, you won't yeah. buy anything. Now, obviously, my view is it's not going to happen. And in my, obviously, my view is MMT is going to work. So the, the traders are going to buy your currency once to see how good it is. And they're going to go up. Yeah. But yeah. how would so, you? Okay. See these so I was, I was in Italy. and I, I was in Italy and I gave like uh, 45 presentations in 60 days or something different universities, different economics groups. And that question always came up. So I, so I actually have a pretty good answer after that much practice. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> say, look, if you take a Ferrari and you drive it to Berlin, mm -hmm. it'll trade for maybe four Mercedes. At the time, the Ferrari might've been 200,000 euros and the Mercedes were 50,000 euros each. Yeah. Okay, and those are your real terms of trade. One Mercedes, one Ferrari's going to, exchange for um, for Mercedes. Okay, and it it doesn't matter where the lira is, where your currency is, or even if you have a currency, the guy in Berlin really doesn't care. He's just taking what you call the world price, real terms of exchange trade for the Ferrari versus Mercedes, and giving you the cars. And you say to him, yeah, but the lira is up 20% or down 20%, so it's not going to change that ratio. Okay, that's that's that is what they trade at in South Africa. You know, they dig up, go out and mine a gold coin, and they go to London in exchanges for a man's suit. Mm -hmm. That's what I used to hear historically. I mean, they don't really care what the level of the rand is, or if there is a rand, or who built it, or it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, but what the currency matters for is who has to dig the gold and who gets to wear the suit. It affects the distribution in the country. Who has to build a Ferrari and who gets to drive the Mercedes? That's, that's what the level of the currency does. Those are internal distributive matters. And that can be, is determined by the rest of the institutional structure. And it's continuously changed with legislative change, with tax change. So that's all under direct control of the Italy or South Africa. They're, they're controlling the distribution within the country. So what I'm saying is, the, the level of the currency doesn't change your real wealth. Mm. Keep everybody working through full employment policy. You're going to produce a certain number of gold, a certain amount of gold. You're going to get a certain amount of men's suits. That's not going to change by the level of the currency. It's a distribution. So if you've got a poor outcome of trade, uh, people are le le losing work, uh, losing jobs. And this is happening and that's happening. To address it, it's a distributional issue, okay? It's a, it's a fiscal issue, it's a financial issue. You can always sustain full employment just by um, you know, fiscal adjustments. There's no way you don't have to have full employment. You can keep full employment. It makes no sense to say, because of this trade issue, currency, this, that, and the other, we're only gonna have 90% of our people employed instead of 100 to fix this other problem. It's not what you do to fix that problem. You stay fully employed, maintain your maximum domestic output, which are your chits that you trade for your imports, and deal with your problem in a way that makes sense to deal with it. You don't shoot yourself in the foot because your checking account won't balance. Now you've got to deal with a foot with a bullet hole, right? So yeah. you still keep yourself healthy to deal with these external problems. Mm. 
And okay, what and so, these guys, sorry, a lot of yeah, people talk about speculators, you know, they, they, they'll yeah. say, oh, well, yeah, I see what you mean, like the, these fundamental forces. What about these sort of bad guys in suits in the city, you know, are all just sell, sell, sell your currency? Won't that sort of bottom it out, you know? So yeah. that's right, in your face, very immediate. How, how would you deal yeah. with that sort of point? <clears throat> well, number one, the change in the value of the currency doesn't affect the real wealth of the country. Right. has distributed effects. Now, you know, the euro not too long ago went from like 145 to, to 100. Mm -hmm. and I didn't hear anybody complaining or anything. In fact, they were being criticized for taking unfair advantage. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Okay. The yen went from 80 to 120 not too long ago in, in a month or two or something. I don't know. Short order, 50% collapse in the value. And nobody's, oh, the, you know, Japanese are like manipulating. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and what's the biggest argument with China? Oh, their currency is too strong. Yeah. Right. So, the, the U.S. dollar has been all over the place. Mm -hmm. Massive moves, right? So, these currencies move all the time. One thing they've discovered is now with today's economies, they don't alter the rate of inflation by enough for people to sort of notice. I mean, yeah. imports go up, and, and and I would say in some countries they will. And it's not. I'm not trying to trivialize the yeah. fact that they they can. It is a Major can be a major contributor to inflation, but the um, currencies fluctuate, and you've got speculators in there. And if you don't want speculation in your currency, there's ways to do that. If you look at the source of the speculation, for example, one of my proposals for banking is that the regulation should not allow banks to make loans where they accept financial assets as collateral. If you want to buy stock, you can't go to a bank with those shares of stock and borrow money to pay for it. You just use your own money or whatever. And uh, if you're the stock exchange, somebody wants to buy on margin, fine, but it better be your own capital because the bank's not going to fund that for you. Okay. That, you know, that would go a ways towards avoiding some of the speculation. Some of it's in the, in the foreign exchange markets. Okay. Also, um, you can use a financial transactions tax not to raise money, but to reduce speculation, to discourage the activity. That's what a transactions tax does. And if you have a, uh, particularly you get international coordination if they want to uh, reduce speculation uh, they, and reduce transactions because it's a waste of human endeavor, then you can uh, do a financial transactions tax. And you can also do it unilaterally if you wanted to have that outcome. And I'm not saying you would necessarily want that outcome, but if that's an important outcome. Uh, the Australian dollar went from 105 to 50 something not in the last few years. Now it's back to 70. Yeah. yeah, there's no big. Is there some major outcry in Australia about? Look, we told you, we we yeah. got to join the euro because look what happened to our currency. No, yeah. <laughs> right? no. so so I guess what is the, or, you know, uh, so what is the point of the questions? You know, they're are they complaining about something? Are they ans asking the question, answering a question that nobody's asking? And, you know, yeah, what's I the mean trade? What's the trade balance between New Jersey and Connecticut? Well, nobody knows. But I guarantee, you, if you publish that number. There'd be a big uproar and somebody do something about it and create a real problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. Absolutely. I mean, in one hand, if, if the currency goes down, it's bad. But apparently if it's good, it's bad. So uh, it's <laughs> a triangle, really, I guess. I've got it. I'm keeping a little bit of on the clock because I've got. OK, a OK. Of, well, I've got like three particular questions I'd like to ask. I'm, I probably yeah. can't get through everything. But there's one from uh, Neil uh, and his question. Is like you know you've got countries like Argentina, Zimbabwe. They've got their own currency, but yeah. they've been in a lot of, in crisis. How would you know they've had inflation problems? How what yeah. advice would you have to these types of countries? You know what what should they do? You know they. Yeah. Uh, what should, what well, should I they would do? say, I would say if you want the UK to go that route, I could give you policies so you could do the same. If you if, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just <laughs> tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know. So each one has different specifics. I know Argentina. What last I saw, they, were, they had a thirty-five percent policy. Rate. But to mm -hmm. me, that's obviously driving the inflation rate, driving the currency down. Yeah. Can you imagine if Pompeii, with those coins, decided to pay thirty-five percent interest on any coins in the street? Yeah. It, you know what would that do to their ability to run the place? If, if they wind up paying people more, everything would have. You know, they'd be flooding the place with money. It would be inflation, highly inflationary. Be, yeah, it's it's fiscal spending, and so they do. Yeah, that. Uh, and they also have. So I've been told. I don't have any 
direct experience, massive what is uh, commonly called a corruption problem. Yeah. Particularly through state owned enterprises, through the banking system, where insiders get uh, access to lending that there's no intention long term to pay back, but they use it. They sell the currency for foreign exchange and drive the, the foreign exchange value down, which causes imports to go up, which things are then indexed to. Yeah. And then they've got all kinds of indexation of government wages and everything else, which is the government paying more for the same thing, causing the inflation. Now, I'm not saying it's not good policy. There's uh, plenty of economic study that shows that. The last one I saw studied inflation rates up to 40% and showed that higher inflation rates not only did not impede growth in the real standard of living, but actually uh, may have promoted it. And so uh, people don't like it. It's the government stealing from you and all that. They've got all the rhetoric behind why they don't like inflation. And so politically, it's, it's political suicide to promote higher inflation. But from an economist's point of view, it's, it's not, it's not an economic negative. It's just a numerator. So yeah, uh, I'm not directly answering your question, but these people have policies and procedures in place that promote what's going on and their massive vested interest interests generally go under the guise of exporters where it's in their interest to do this. Their interest is to suppress domestic demand, to have as cheap a labor as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't care what the level of the currency is. They're just looking for the, uh, their real terms of trade. And if their real costs are lower through inflation, then they benefit by uh, doing this. Now, I've said to throw out for thought that today's exporters are Marxist capitalists. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Because the exporters have no interest in the well-being of the domestic economy or domestic demand. In fact, they want it to be lower. But domestic businesses, like the U.S. used to have, you know, with the auto companies yeah. before we had competition, they didn't care if they'd all get together, give the unions whatever raise they want, and increase prices because those are the people buying their cars, and the whole country would was kind of indexed. And so, as long as domestic demand was going up, as long as their competitors were in the same boat with costs, they they really didn't mind uh, having a larger share going to labor, you know, because it was good for them. Okay, but for the exporter, he just wants to get his inputs as cheaply as possible, as low cost as real cost as possible. And so he has absolutely no interest in the well-being of the domestic economy. In fact, he has no, the worse it is, the better off he is. So he should not even have a seat at the table for national economic discussion because his interests are counter to everybody. Now, under Obama, President Obama said, look, the problem with the country is we consume too much and don't export enough. We have to export more and consume less. Okay, backwards already counterproductive. Yeah. And then who does he point as his chief economic advisor? Jeff Immel, who is head of General Electric, who is the largest export. That's what happens when you put exporters in control. And the exporters are clearly in control in the major exporting countries like China and Japan, Korea. They all get um, you know, praised by all the rest of the world's yeah. leaders as doing the right thing and whatnot. They're just suppressing domestic standard of living for the for their own uh, you know it's their own benefit at the expense of the macro population. It's another one of your seeing things differently. So what are heroes yeah. are in fact zeros, Warren. Uh, if yeah. I say the pun. Now I'm gonna ask I'm gonna be imaginative now I'm gonna be creative. Yeah. Okay so say I mean it's very unlikely but Say we got rid of Boris and all the bumblers here over in Britain. And we had a progressive, open-minded government. So I, thought you, I thought Yeltsin was already gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you get him back. I don't know. The <laughs> guy who didn't really get economics, but oh, was okay. open-minded and progressive, and yeah. invited you in, and you could have a team around you and say, yeah. right, now with the COVID problem yeah. we've got, and post-COVID, let's assume there's a new post-COVID world. And he said, right, Warren, you're in charge. Whatever you tell us to do, yeah. what are you going to do? All right. Okay. In simple terms, you know, what would be like maybe your top two or three priorities that you would tell in Britain uh, now and post-COVID? What, what would you like to see we us do differently at the economic level? Well, you know, look, the first thing you do is you set up the Swiss bank accounts. <laughs> Then you conduct policy to make sure you fill them up as much as you can before you get voted out. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure I'd be any different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. 
Am I missing something here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so if I was, <laughs> yeah, if I ruled the world, or at least Britain, yeah. no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, the, you know, first of all, we have to establish what you know where we want to be in four years, or two years, or five years, yeah. right? and then figure out how to get from here to there. So what are the yeah. goals? What, what are we trying to accomplish here? What are we trying to do? So yeah. uh, I, I don't know the details there as well as I do here, but you know, the first thing I would say is look, because you know, I, I give a little bit of priority on this. We have eliminated emissions by, yeah. you know, or let's say environmental degradation, but I've seen numbers is up to 40% by eliminating non-essentials. Yeah. Okay, so like what's, these are non-essentials. It's not by eliminating something we desperately need. These are non-essentials. We're sitting here with 20 million unemployed and nobody's lacking for any essentials. Yeah. Okay, now they might be running out of money to pay for it, but the essentials themselves are in full production. They're available, the, sh the shelves are full. Okay. Yeah. So do we want to get back to where we were by resuming the consumption of non-essentials at the expense of environmental degradation. Is that just substituting one non-essential for another or have we added a non-essential and eliminated an essential, which is to eliminate this environmental degradation? So yeah. am, I, am I part of that? So if, you, if you're asking me what I would do, I have to like understand where the position is on that. Me personally, mm -hmm. I would not add back non-essentials that also contribute to environmental degradation. So I'd have that outlined first. Yeah. So things that will be coming back, things that we're doing are not going to be things that wind up reversing what, look, if we, had, if we hadn't had COVID, we never could have gotten to this level of environmental degradation in 30 years with all the green deals coming out. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've gained through conservation. I don't know if you remember, we talked about it or not a year ago before COVID. I said, I think we can save 50% on conservation in this new green deal without spending a dime or, or resource yeah. just by through conservation. And I think this has proved it, has, has, has proven it that because um, there are more non-essentials we could eliminate now, some of them have come back. And with it comes a massive savings of uh, in terms of the environment. So um, emissions and everything else. Yeah. Okay. so. Have we established that or, or I'm happy with is, that. is that part of my job? Do I get the job? You got the you job. Know, this, is part of, this is part of my job. And right. yeah, you got it. If I so was now, that so, yeah, so, now, so number one, I'm not, you know, we're gonna have to look at the areas that we don't want to come back because yeah. they're not environmentally sustainable. Whatever they're not, they don't meet our environmental goals. We're just not gonna have them. Yeah. All right. And so I've got a lot of detail there, but we're running out of time. So yeah. the next thing is on the financial side. Yeah. So we, we want to, how much financial support do we want to give? To, who do we want to give it to? We, we want to sustain demand so that people can live without desperation. Um, but as work comes back, we want them to shift back into employment because otherwise what we have now is a massive supply shock. Fortunately, it's been largely non-essentials, but if we're going to go forward, we'd like that supply shock to get reversed in terms of essentials. And so, the, I, so how do you do that counter cyclically? Well, that's through unemployment compensation. So you, I propose five hundred dollars a week on federal unemployment compensation because, not that it's necessarily exactly the right number, but if the economy gets worse, more people are going to get it. If the economy improves, it's going to go away. So it's kind of a one-time thing in that sense until we get back to normal levels, to, you know, much lower levels of unemployment. Uh, and part of that comes with it is a job guarantee, but job guarantee doesn't do you any good if it's not safe to go to work. Yeah. Who, who's got things to do, who doesn't? So a, a, quiet, a job guarantee and unemployment compensation, I can kind of quasi mix, blend yeah. that in. And I, and I come up with the idea of telling all the nonprofits that we will fund $15 an hour jobs, job guarantee jobs to anybody that willing and able to work, anybody they want to hire. You can put them on your payrolls, knowing that when the economy picks up, you're probably going to lose them. But in the meantime, 
if you're the American Heart Association, you've got somebody there to help you take volunteers yeah. to the hospital or whatever you've got to do. Okay, so that plus federal and state unemployment compensation, kind of the same thing. So now anybody who wants to work can get in and they will do things that we're only going to approve nonprofits who are doing environmentally correct things that we want to do. We're not going to do anybody that's going to get into non-essentials and uh, uh, that consume energy. So that would be my main counter cyclical anchor. Yeah. Because the people who've lost the money are the people who've lost their jobs. Now, as far as yeah. small businesses and whatnot, those people have also lost their jobs, so they'll be getting paid, so they'll be okay. Do we care if the restaurant stays open or if it closes? I'm not sure. And I don't think that's high priority at the moment. Okay, but what is high priority is to make sure the owners don't starve, that they can feed, they can eat, feed their family. The husband and wife that were running the restaurant are getting unemployment compensation. They fully qualify. Yeah. And maybe it would be slightly more for an entrepreneur or something like that who had had, it could be somewhat income adjusted, but it doesn't have to be. But they, they qualify, they're in. Okay, so once I've done that, I feel like I've given everybody a safety net who's now out of work. The people who are still working or making money, they don't need the safety net. Now we have to look at these business, these businesses like the airlines that would have otherwise gone bankrupt. Bankruptcy is a state takeover. The bankruptcy court is a state agent. So they've been, when you go bankrupt, you are nationalized. And then you are liquidated, brought back, whatever. You are resolved under national law, federal law here, your national law. All right, so I think... So in that sense, one of my proposals was we need to, instead of just giving support to these companies, we should nationalize them, the ones that will otherwise fail. Yeah. And the same way we do in bankruptcy, where it becomes the ward of the court. And uh, we decide at that point how much financing we want to continue for them to limp along and what happens to them, to the capitalization, to everything else once things if, when and if they turn around, when and if we want them to turn around. We may not want airlines again. Okay, we may decide we want to cut flight by 75% or something because of uh, you know the environmental side. I don't know. So uh, we don't just want to have people fly as much as they can afford. And maybe, maybe there was too much flying before. Maybe there was too much traveling before. And maybe it's not something we want to uh, encourage run incentives not to travel and other things which would mean airlines and other transportation networks uh, shouldn't be there. You know, there's a particular fascination with the rails in the U.S., trains, high yeah. speed rails and all that. Well, you know, we used to have a saying in cars, boats, speed costs money. How fast do you want to go? With yeah. more speed comes more environmental degradation. So maybe we don't want things to go so fast. It's like an inverse square law. And you know, and if you notice, the rails cost a lot more than the buses. Yeah. Why is that? Well, might be because there's more resources being torn up. <laughs> Sometimes that has something to do with the cost, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, you know, and so, I, I mean, and I'm getting off on of him. I had this idea that if we just had the buses run on the same lines as the rails do, just pave the outside of the tracks and let the buses straddle the tracks, they wouldn't have any traffic congestion problems. They run relatively dirt cheap. We can, they're now being electrified, which is the ideal place for them to be electrified. They wouldn't even need batteries. You could have yeah. you know, connectivity along these rails. Like this. And uh, we don't have to go at 120 miles an hour. We could go at 40, 50 miles an hour and get there quickly because there's no congestion along the rails. And then just, they're much more efficient. You get 20 or 30 or 40 people, the bus goes. You don't have trains that are running back and forth empty all the time. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, those are just the directions I'm thinking. Well, you, you, uh, you I've know, got a really interesting thing for you, by the way. Sorry, so, go for it, Warren. That you, you're going to want to see. Okay. What has MMT done, accomplished in the last 30 years? It's been a grassroots movement. Yeah. Okay. There's not a single person with what you call credentials involved. None of the academics I don't care how, I know that some of them are the best, but they're not noticed, known as the best. Okay, they, none of them have 
what we call Ivy League credentials or top academic credentials. None of them went to any of the top economic schools or, or uh, came from the top mm -hmm. political connections or anything else. Everybody has been grassroots from the bottom up. Stephanie Kelton, uh, who is now, I'd say, the most influential economist in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill Mitchell, maybe because you know of his, uh, you know, he's out there doing the same types of things. But Stephanie, with her book and the whole international thing and the whole way it's formed the uh, thinking in the U.S. We just went through three trillion and now two trillion more of fiscal. Nobody's even talked about taxes. The word taxes never even come up. That would not have happened a year ago without Stephanie and her book and what she's done. So I'm not, you know, even if people don't want to speak to her capabilities, they think she's all wrong, they think she can't tie her own shoes and she's part of the squad or whatever they want to think, they can't take away the fact that she's the most influential economist right now in the world. And maybe Bill's there, but less on the headlines because he's been influential in the UK, in Japan, Australia, China, and places that you know, were not under the radar, but Stephanie's there on top of the radar. Yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of rec name recognition. You know, so, how did it get there? What was it? What is MMT? MMT is a grassroots movement that started with one person, then two, then four, then eight, word of mouth. None of them celebrity status, with any celebrity status, no noted experts. But what are we spreading? We're spreading the idea that the, um, Central bankers in the world, the leading economists um, don't understand monetary operations. Okay, we're not trying to cure COVID. <laughs> we're not talking about saving the whales or any visible cause. Our cause is they they've got the debits and understanding of the debits and credits and the Federal Reserve wrong. All right. So who? How probable is it that a group of people starting with one to two to four to eight would have multiplied into this massive force in the world that's managed to forever change mainstream economics, finance, politics, everything else, okay, over an understanding of accounting. <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah. that's like, does that make any sense? Yeah. Does, I mean, is that probable? Like, what kind of a cause gets together? Okay, the revolution starts because of injustice. Yeah, you know, we've got we've got massive systemic racism, and so you get movements behind this stuff. We have an environmental movement, okay, that's working. Yeah, this was a a movement to change the understanding of of monetary operations in the Federal Reserve and the central banks. Yeah, by by the central, you know, of the central bankers themselves. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's it's done and got the job done when all these other things that have real causes. We're struggling. <laughs> yeah, well, it's. I'm it's, not saying they won't succeed, but I'm saying like, who's going to pay for it? You know that you said it. Yeah, yeah. Good. They always say anyone who's good, well, going to yeah. Now, right, right, right. It's right. that so, question out the park. You know. Yeah, yeah. So the answer, it. the answer is you don't understand monetary operations inside the, <laughs> yeah, inside the central bank. You don't understand this. Other you know, so yourself, all these other people who have contributed to this massive movement of individuals who don't know anything about monetary operations have managed to get the understanding changed. How yeah. probable is it that that would have ever happened or people, people would be dedicated to doing that? And that's like, you know, something it's worth taking a look at to you know, take a step back and look at it. You say, I look at things differently. And uh, I'm just astounded that, you know, you've got this, I, I, I have a, a poster that we use at a, uh, one of those, protest things. And it said, yeah. I've just put on my Facebook page, way, way back from Bulgaria, I think it said, we demand aggregate demand. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty wonky, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's somehow gotten there. Yeah. So, so, you know, I just, my hat's off to everybody involved in the fact that they're doing it and how successful they've been, yeah. you know, on a one-to-one -one basis and how um, you know, the dedication and the intensity of the whole thing. Yeah. I think it's because it, we Over. MMT is think that can make ultimately the world a better place. It might be founded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One trip. Yeah, by, by by changing an understanding of accounting right? identities. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, by changing an you know yeah. finances understanding of their own accounting. It's yeah. like okay. <laughs> the first little domino you knock it, 
And then yeah. all these other causes, if you understand the, the monetary operation, yeah. Then yeah, they're all based on all these things fit. We just got to do yeah, that yeah, yeah. first, you know? I mean, yeah. sometimes I talk to people who are on about all the world's problems, and I say, look, yeah. look, let's start with the money. And they look at me and say, look, we've got to, this is your starting point. You know what the first question will be? Who's going to pay for it? So we're going yeah, to get yeah. them dealt with first. And it's not difficult. Yeah. You know, yeah, not yeah. listeners are thinking, yeah, it's not difficult. And they'll yeah. all be inspired by what you said, Warren. You know, I'm sure yeah. they will be. You know, yeah. now the thing is, I don't know how long we've got because looking at okay. my, we've now used an hour and a half. So I might have to see. I'm going to go into chat, Warren. Okay. See if how long I can talk. He says, keep going. So yeah. I, I've okay. got a question. Yeah, go. And now I don't know. Which one? Uh, can you hear me, Sarah? I'm just wondering if Sarah can put her question out there for me. So I see one question was, why is unemployment a monetary phenomenon? Yeah, I think you've already it's, it's because, that. yeah, it only occurs in a monetary economy. It doesn't occur anywhere else. Can you send me yours, Sarah, on the chat? Because Sarah had a great question. I, I thought she was going okay. to it herself. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and paraphrase it. And now, with forgiveness. Now, what what Sarah's question was, I think, was you know, like when we had uh, in the the beginning of neoliberalism, yeah, seventies. Surely, people must have realised that this was kind of all this sort of monetarism, markets work. Surely, there must have been a lot of people who realised this was a bad turn. What? Why do you think that they were swamped, or what was your view of what actually happened in those days? I mean, you okay. say, say that again. You say that again. So you know, like in in the seventies, when yeah, if you like the beginnings of neoliberalism, Bill talks about in Britain, oh, yeah. nineteen seventies. Yeah. Suddenly, everything was changed. Markets were, you know, yeah, we've yeah. got a view of the world differently. Yeah. Surely, what, what's the puzzle? How? How in such a crazy way to view the world? Oh, what about oh, the guys yeah, yeah, yeah. That then? What 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 were they doing sitting on the that hands? A, How did it happen? That was our buddies of Keynesians and the post Keynesians. Okay, yeah. it's the headline left. It's the headline left that's been the whole problem. Their only answer to the seventies inflation was price and wage controls, and people didn't want the government coming in telling everybody what they could pay and what they could charge. They didn't want that. And right. so the alternative was this monetarism, which, while it didn't work, it bought enough time for, you know, OPEC to uh, demand for oil to collapse in 1980 for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And OPEC collapsed, the price of oil came down, the inflation went away. And at the same time that monetarism had started, which had nothing to do with that happening, by the way, and it was all, it was all fiscal stuff that made that happen. The uh, U.S. economy went into, uh, the fiscal got very tight in 1979. And demand collapsed. And uh, in real terms, because the inflation was so high, the actual nominal budget deficit in real terms uh, went down. We were running what you call a real surplus, right? So <laughs> the inflation adjusted public debt went down. And so uh, we had a big collapse of the economy and demand for oil collapsed. Oil prices came down and it was all mon monetarism happened to be in the right place at the right time to get the credit for it. And, and that's still lingering. Yeah. And the post-Keynesian response of price and wage controls was hadn't worked during the 70s. And that was just considered a failure and uh, was immensely distasteful. And uh, again, because they didn't understand the source of the price level and, and came up with the wrong answer. And so here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, this, I mean, Sarah sent something to me, which was good. She's just asking, you know, the, with the COVID crisis, do you think it's been... Yeah uses a bit of a smoke screen for kind of uh, neoliberalism 2.0, you know, are, are things that are somewhat undesirable being hidden behind there with maybe related to this great reset? I mean, I've not heard of, I don't know if you have this thing from the World Economic Forum. I don't know if you've come across that. But do you think that, that it's a bit like the Arab oil crisis was a, 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 a sort yeah. of a... I don't know, cover for bringing in the more Pellerin society ideas. Do you think COVID can be a bit of a small screen for neoliberalism too? Well, for the neoliberals, that's all they know. Right, okay. You know, and, they, and so um, the ones I've talked to, they kind of pontificate a little bit, not, not, not in uh, 
not trying to be offensive, but that's all they can do. And and they uh, and they that's all they know. Yeah. And they don't they don't know anything else. And and uh, what do they say? You know, you know, a lot of the people have been successful making money or successful inheriting money. Yeah. And so they're the ones who get to get hurt, and yeah. that they went to the right schools, and there there is no other. They don't know anything else except you know at all. So I don't know. Yeah, it's. I mean, I know we're a little bit over time, Warren, but I my last point really is just for. Oh, I've got time. I've got time. It's up to you. All right. Well, um, yeah. I've we can take another ten minutes or so. If you'd like, just for, for you, just to um, I don't know how long the Zoom lasts or anything like that, but just to say, if you were giving like a closing message, like a little feeling for your for the activists, what advice would you give us? Maybe generally, or I don't know whether this has gone global, but for MMT yeah. is in Britain, or what what should we be focusing in terms of how our interaction with political parties, pressure groups, interested individuals? Yeah. You know, if you're inspiring your MMT activists, what what would you say? Other than you know, you've already said it's a fantastic grassroots movement. What what should your your grassroots followers be doing, really? Yeah. So uh, somebody flashed up a question about robots. Can I address that quickly? You can, of course. Okay. So uh, let's say we have robots doing everything. Yeah. And so nobody actually has to work. But then they put a tax on everybody's house. Yeah. If you don't pay the tax, you're going to get your house burned down. Yeah. Well, right. And now you're looking for work to get that money to earn the tax, even though you don't actually need it. And if they tell you, okay, you've got to all have to dig holes, and half of you are digging holes, and the other half are filling it in, well, that's what you're going to do. And you're unemployed until they give you that job. So don't confuse a productivity story with an unemployment story. Productivity is good stuff. That's what gets us here. We want more, as much productivity as possible so we get the most um, out of the least effort and get the most things back. That increases our real wealth. Uh, we want to be able to cut the grass with lawnmowers instead of scissors so we can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so uh, the unemployment story is always an unspent income story. It's always a monetary phenomenon. It's always about the... Uh, population seeking the money to pay the tax and doing what the government says you have to do to get it either directly or indirectly. There's nothing more to that story. It's got nothing about doing with productivity. Okay. So back to your. Well, well I might I'll give you a little story, uh, Warren, which just, just yeah. fit in with your robots. You know, you people also are robots and technology always takes away jobs, you know, and I was always thinking you always get more jobs when you bring in technology. I mean, when I started teaching, there was only three basic types of adults in a school. You have the teachers, you have the dinner ladies, and then you had kind of the secretarial staff stroke caretaker, and that's all you had. And, the main main adults in the building were uh, were teachers. Nowadays, in the school, you wander about. A guy walked past. I do that. He was the website manager. Said, what? Then there was have a business manager, and they have loads of IT technicians because all we got this automation. The thing goes wrong, and they have to fix them. And there's loads of them. We've got a massive marketing department. So this, you know, they were on about it in the 19th century about this automation. And I like in the seventies. Apparently, now we're going to get robots delivering our tea. You know, in the morning, you know, like in the morning, it would come up. You know, but <laughs> I'm working long more than I've ever done. I'm in my sixties, yeah. So I, it makes me laugh that in a way. Well, that's that's actually a, a bad thing. That's actually negative productivity. If it takes more people to do the same thing. Look, we start. We get up in the morning, and there's always more to do than there are people to do it in the world. Yeah, always. And you could ask people, how many of you would like to hire a personal assistant just to help you out with what you do. You're a university professor. How many research assistants would you like? Yeah. You're at home, you know, taking care of the house. How many assistants would you like to help you with your emails and your pictures and yeah. taking care of your correspondence and helping you in the house, whatever you're doing? So everybody would raise their hand and say, yeah, I'd like to have a personal assistant to help me. And you say, okay, well, let's say the government said we'll give you everybody enough money to hire a personal assistant. So you can all mm -hmm. have one. Well, yeah. then how many, how many personal assistants will there be? There won't be any. Because if everybody yeah. wants one, who is the personal assistant? Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there aren't any. You yeah. all want yeah. one. Okay? So we start <laughs> off every day with at least 100% labor shortage. Okay? Before, before any of this other stuff yeah. you talked about. So there's a massive labor shortage all the time. Unemployment is about a money shortage, not a shortage of things to do. 
a shortage of, of, of new funds. Yeah. It's what uh, a friend of mine called the money fam. <laughs> yeah. So you, you don't have to come up with, you don't have to come up with things. You don't have to come up with yeah. things to do. There's always way too much to do. Oh, that's, yeah. that's the human Tell condition. There's more to do than there is time to do it. Right. Yeah. I couldn't, I didn't okay. have time to uh, paint the ceiling as well as do the garden and prepare for this interview. Yeah. I'm going to sneak another question, Warren, yeah. if that's all right, from Sarah, because, you know, she's yeah, one yeah. of the national, as you know. She says, uh, you may be able to see it on your screen. I don't know. It says, uh, Warren, can you talk briefly about the compliance costs of collecting tax uh, and the removing sure. of the drag from the economy as per an athlete? Yeah. So uh, I looked at the income tax for a long time. And so the compliance costs are the costs of everybody having to do a tax return, all the record keeping that everybody has to do to keep track of how much money you make, all the record keeping that your employer has to do that they wouldn't have to do for taxes, paying tax consultants, uh, tax attorneys, all the, the uh, university time of learning all these jobs all the uh, tax compliance work that businesses do, all the time spent in court, all the appeals and all the trials and all the offshore real resources that get used in terms of part of compliance is to decide which country to set up it and where to do it and hire people there and have offices you wouldn't otherwise have. And when I talked to a friend of mine at the University of Chicago and I said, I thought this could easily be 10 or 15% of GDP. He said, uh, it might be more than that. <laughs> so I don't know what it is, but it's, it's staggering. Okay, so let's say it's 15% of GDP for a number. So that means if you abolish the income tax and went to, let's say, a property tax, and I, you know, I know there's just all these people for property tax. But let's say you did it just based on the idea that the compliance cost for the property tax almost the government takes the property and sells it. They don't even care who owns it. So, um, so let's say you've got near zero compliance costs. So now you've just saved 15% of GDP. Well, most of that is services. We're in goods and services. So we're not going to get more things for sale at the grocery store because there's already enough to eat for everybody. But you're going to be, you know, all these new public services or private services will be available. And so let's look at real consumption. So who is going to increase their real assumption, real consumption? Okay, so people with in the upper third income earners population, older people, they're probably not going to increase their consumption all that much. Older people might have better service at the nursing home or something like that, but they don't, they don't, they're not large consumers to begin with, and they're not restricted by money, so to speak. Okay. So if we get a 15% increase, I'm probably going to go to the lowest 60% of consumers, which is which means they're going, they're going to get a 25% increase in real GDP. The lowest income earners are going to get a 20. And if a lot of that's public services that are available to everybody, like better free education at an enhanced level for everybody and that type of thing, it means that it, it, it's an enormously progressive thing to do because if you look at the distribution of consumption, which is what ultimately counts, then um, you're helping, you know, the, that will improve if there is a Gini coefficient for that dramatically as the lower income earners consumption of real goods and services goes up disproportionately to, to their income, many times their income where it'll only go up a fraction of their, where they are for people who are in the upper half, let's say. So, um, you know, they're still only going to eat three meals a day. They're not going to take more vacations or fly more in private jets. They're already going wherever they want. Okay, so one of the more progressive things that we could do would be to eliminate income tax to get rid of the compliance costs. Now, yes, there are some, there is progressivity to the income tax that we would lose in a progressive sense, but in a real sense, the gains are staggering versus that loss. And that loss, a isn't all that much to begin with because people compensation is more by net income than gross income. You can look at gross minus taxes, but at the end of the day, you have to go by what you can live on. And it's net income. It's a net that you should be looking at. 
you know, in fact, uh, uh, the IMF and other agencies don't even count gross income for people that work for government and related agencies. They just look at that income. And so, um, and, and if you replace it with um, a no compliance tax, again, like a, like a uh, property tax on, on real estate, then, then you've, I think we've taken an enormous step forward in terms of progressivity. And then the way I go after the distribution of income that still is going to be an issue is to go after it at source rather than trying to use the tax structure to capture it after somebody's already got the money because that has historically not been successful in spite of you know, really well-meaning attempts over the years by a lot of governments. And so I'm not sure I can do it any better than the people who've tried and failed, but I sure can get rid of the uh, income at source. And the big test has been my proposal for permanent zero rate policy. And I've noticed that in the last few years, the income distribution sp spread has not been widening um, the way it was earlier. And I think a large part of that is the zero rate policy has taken away all that interest in income from higher income earners. The, the basic income for people who already had money has been taken away and it's having its effect on keeping, at least keeping that distribution from widening. And, uh, but there hasn't, there's not enough data out now that I've seen because nobody's actually been looking for it. And I always see 30 years of data and I have to look at the last three years on that 30 year chart and say, hey, looks like it flattened out a little at the end. Yeah, yeah. Now, Warren. Because nobody's actually like, gone into that detail. Yeah. There's a little okay. message. Addy, uh, I might pronounce his name wrong. And he says, thank you, Warren. You are an unfailing inspiration to us grassroots toilers. <laughs> and then adds a topical point. A robot couldn't do that. So in, now, uh, my just as your part <laughs> We're all getting a bit tired now. I could miss you all night, but I, I ought to go make an appearance. The dogs are back. But uh, basically, you know, okay. that last point I made about what, if you had a short sort of what, what we should be doing, what, what sort of, I yeah, yeah. Know, you know, that last point before we talk about role. Yeah. So, so, so we need to, the three things would be number one, the, on the financial side would be the uh, unemployment compensation. And then number two, the uh, job for anybody who wants one. And of course, all in the context of not going backwards, you know, in terms of environmental degradation going forward. Number three, the states, municipalities in the U.S., at least probably in the U.K., mm -hmm. because of the slowdown in rating their police protection and whatnot. So you need the central government funded by the central bank to uh, support those through grants, which I say should be done on a per capita basis to all the state and local authorities. In your case, it would be the cities and the towns, whatever local authorities you have the, throughout the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's under pound sterling should be getting on a per capita basis a distribution to their local public services to support their local public services. Those are essentials. They're not resource uh, consumers. So yeah. that would be, and I think those three things would be sufficient. We then have another political imperative, which is to make it safe to go to work, safe to go to work in areas where we want people to go to work, where we don't uh, degrade the environment. Yeah. Well, thanks, Warren. It's been brilliant. We've run over time okay. a bit, uh, which I'm sure no one will be worried about. Um, it, it's been a real okay. inspiration. Uh, I hope everyone's looking forward to our Weimar paper on the website. I'd like to point uh, out to you, please go for to the GIM site, see what's on there. Go on the Warren site if you haven't been already on his mandatory readings. There's so much great stuff there. Look at Warren's book, you know, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds, Soft Currency Economics. So there's all free on all free online, <laughs> all online, yeah, all there for you to enjoy. You know, uh, keep in touch with GIMS. I'm sure, uh, if Warren's enjoyed it, uh. He's a popular man. A lot of people like to interview Warren. Apparently, you've been interviewed already once today by someone else, I've heard. So <laughs> we'll try and get Warren back, return of Warren, uh, when I can ask him about boats and uh, yeah. cars and other things I just didn't have time to. But uh, I'll wind up there with a huge thanks from me and from Gims and on behalf of all the people tuning in. Thanks, Warren. 
you can open your shutters if there's any daylight left. I don't know. What, I assume there will be a bit to enjoy out there. I don't know if you have a parting message for your listeners and viewers. Oh, I do. I'm jealous. It's slightly. Uh, it's just stopped raining. It's yeah. slightly nicer it's there. Just yeah. stopped raining. Yeah. Does it ever rain there? You know, not a lot, but it did rain the last today. So yeah. I don't feel so bad. You didn't take me away from anything today, because but it did stop raining just as when we're done. So I'm ready to get outside, hit a few tennis balls, and uh, get some lunch. It's only. Uh, it's yeah, going on two o'clock. Now the fact you beat me uh, six nil, six nil in our only game, and uh, I, I'll gloss over that. But uh, it was a bit <laughs> of for me. But at least I managed to play two sets and not, yeah. not collapse. All the, well, the whole idea, the whole, the whole idea is to stay fit. You know, none of us are going to win any championships. No. Well, if what <laughs> I'm certainly not Warren. But right, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> See you soon, Warren. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I got your messages and very much appreciated. Take care. Thank you.